Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the GA Lean Body Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Keane, a strength and conditioning coach and sports nutritionist here to help you with all things GA related fitness. Today's episode is a Q&A, so some of the questions coming in from my Instagram weekly Q&A on a Thursday. So if you're not following me on Instagram, Brian underscore Keane underscore fitness on Instagram. And we're going to jump into a couple of different topics in today's podcast. So hopefully you get a load of value from it. First question, Brian, I started kicking with my left foot, but it doesn't seem to be improving. Are some people just naturally one-footed? The short answer is most people are going to have a naturally dominant side. Same with your hand. You're going to have a dominant hand for writing and for any maneuver or anything that you need to do that takes a little bit of coordination. Similar to your kicking, you're going to have a dominant foot, your left or right foot. But to say that someone is naturally one-footed and can't improve it also wouldn't be accurate because what happens with learning how to kick with an opposite foot or the same when hurling how to puck and hit with the opposite side is a lot of it is just understanding how muscular patterns work and how your central nervous system patterns work when it comes to mechanical movements and the mistake a lot of people make when it comes to kicking with one foot is the same mistakes that can affect your ability to practice in a consistent and deliberate way and there's an old adage that practice makes perfect but something i've been a long-term subscriber to with athletes is practice makes permanent meaning that if you start to practice kicking with your right foot or your left foot your non-dominant foot and you do it with a poor technique that will become ingrained as a movement in your muscular movement pattern and then that's very difficult to break so what i'd say on the front end is anybody can improve with their weaker side. Some people will need to give it a longer runway of time, particularly older athletes. So somebody who's you know seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, this is way easier, same as learning a language. Whereas when you're in your 20s, in your 30s, it's harder, but not impossible. You just need to give yourself a longer runway of time. What I'd say is you're trying to mimic the movement pattern that you kick with your dominant foot onto your non-dominant leg now that sounds really obvious real captain obvious answer i know but a mistake a lot of people make initially when they're trying to learn to kick with their opposite foot is they'll drop the ball with their dominant hand because that's what feels most natural to you so you'll have a person who's a natural right footer will drop the ball with their right hand onto their right foot and then when they start to practice their left foot they'll start dropping the ball with their right hand onto their left foot And the temptation can be sometimes to keep moving with that because it feels easier, it feels less foreign. But if you need to practice dropping the ball on the opposite side and the non-dominant side, the exact same way as you do with your dominant leg and dominant hand. So I would use a wall and just a basic wall that you're kicking the ball off. And what happens with kicking with your non-dominant side is it feels so far and it's the same as if you pick up a pencil or you pick up a pen and try and write with that non-dominant hand it feels really awkward and it just feels foreign it feels like it's somebody else's body and that is what happens when you start practicing with your weaker foot initially but you do get this little bit of a a, a, a gap where it'll start to feel more natural and you'll start to feel more confident kicking it in a unchallenged position, i.e. you're against a wall in your back garden or you're kicking it with a friend in the backyard or at the pitch. You won't find that there's an issue because you're starting to perform the technique. It gets more and feels more natural to you. What people sometimes fail to realize when you're trying to work on a weak body part like this where you're trying to improve a non-dominant side is there's chasms that you need to cross in terms of how you apply it in your game because what will happen first and foremost and knowing this spectrum and knowing this timeline can be helpful because otherwise it gets frustrated and irritated because you're wondering why you aren't getting better faster firstly you will find that you're confident when you're by yourself you can kick it against the wall with your left foot your weaker foot and you'll start to feel confident with that you will then progress that into i can kick it across the field to a teammate before practice But then you'll try and apply it in a game and it won't work. It's a different scenario. It's a different circumstance in a different environment that you're trying to apply the skill. So you need to know that firstly you start, it's the high end to use an analogy that people are familiar with of walking before or crawling before you can walk, walking before you can run. You need to be able to confidently feel like you can kick with that leg and use that non-dominant side when you're by yourself. Then the next transition is to be able to do it with another person. One, for the security of 
doing it and kicking the ball accurately to somebody else that's moving. And then the next progression will be to actually apply it in training drills and in games. And what I would suggest, and this is what I did. Now, this isn't my circle of competence in terms of skill acquisition. I'm a strength and conditioning coach and a sports nutritionist. But what I can tell you what I did, and I have equally strong on both sides, it's actually one of the real advantages if you have an injury on one side, you can switch to your non-dominant leg. So, for example, I would be naturally left-footed, but my right foot is very strong. But if I have an injury on one side and it's painful to kick, you can, I can very easily switch on to my left side or my right side. My right side actually got considerably weaker as I'm rehabbing from an inductor injury. But again, that's something that will improve as the year goes on again once that gets rehabbed out. But what I'd say here is what worked for me was I would intentionally go to training drills. Now, this is when you've assumed or I'm assuming you've got your kind of place nailed in and you're not trying to impress new coaches, new trainers, new managers. I wouldn't recommend doing this in that context. But if you have and you have a team that you're playing with, college team, underage team, senior team, junior team, that your position's pretty nailed on, all the training drills, I would practice them on your weaker side. Meaning that when the game comes around, go back to your dominant foot and whatever feels most natural to you. But all the drills, all the kicking drills, all the hand passing drills, everything you do in the lead up before the game, do it with your non-dominant side and get used to doing it in match situations and in game context situations. And what will happen then is it'll start to become more natural. It'll become what's called your new normal. You won't feel as foreign switching on to that non-dominant side or kicking with that non-dominant foot. And then slowly and gradually, you can integrate it into your game. And then as you integrate it into your game and you start to see some of your passes going to where you want them to go or the ball or the goal or the point going where you want it to go, you'll start to build up that confidence. And then that confidence confidence comes from competence and competence comes from repeated exposure to the movement. So once you're doing that, it can be a very useful way and a, a linear progression to going from I actually can't use this foot to feeling confident with using it during games. As I said, not my high end of expertise, but it's something that I've done and something that I've used and it was very effective. I started to learn to kick with my right foot, which was my non-dominant foot when I was about 14 and by 15, 16 I was equally strong on both sides and it was because I would go to drills and with my club because I was playing underage county but when I go to club training I always used my non-dominant side I would always solo with my weak foot and I would always kick with my weak foot and hand pass with my weak hand in club training and then it would transition over into games and I felt more confident with it so that's some tips and hopefully some tricks that will help you when it comes to improving that non-dominant side. Brian do you think there's any difference in hurlers versus footballers as athletes? I think there's very little difference in terms of the physique and fitness requirements in both. You probably need to be a little bit more physically tough in hurling. But again, that depends on where you're playing and the level you're playing compared hurling to football. But in terms of physical athletic ability, they're very close. I would I would say probably as close as you can get when it comes to two different sports. And it's funny because when you think of other sports that have a little bit of a crossover, soccer and rugby have a little bit of a crossover, but they're still a million miles away from hurling and football. Because with soccer, you need to be very aerobically fit and have quite good levels of muscular endurance, where you don't need to be as physically strong. Rugby, you need to be very strong, powerful, and potentially quick over a short distance. Whereas you don't need to be super aerobically fit, although it helps. With Gaelic football, it splits the difference between these two sports. I think it's one of the reasons why, as a strength and conditioning coach and a sports nutritionist, it fascinates me as a sport. And even in my years when I wasn't playing, I loved working with players because there's so many requirements with hurling and football. You have to be fit. You have to be strong. You have to be skillful. You have to be fast. All of these things... Whereas in other sports, you need to have a combination of, you know, a hierarchy of needs, i.e. soccer, you need to be more muscular endurance and have a higher aerobic fitness. Rugby, you need to be physically strong. There's a hierarchy of needs. Whereas with football and hurling, they're quite similar in terms of their hierarchy. They're very, you can't really have one without the other. And I think that's what makes the sport so phenomenal and makes the athletes that play it so phenomenal. But it also means that there's a, a difficulty in designing your program and designing your nutrition. And someone that has worked with quite high-level GA players, quite high-level rugby players, and quite high-level soccer players over my, the past 10 years, 
the hardest, although most rewarding athletes to work with are hurlers and footballers because it's you're trying to juggle a lot of things at once. Whereas with a rugby plan, it's very easy to put somebody on a power phase and then a strength phase and then a combination and a maintenance phase. With soccer, it's similar. You put them on an endurance phase, an aerobic fitness phase, a little bit of a strength program, but it doesn't have to be too dominant. With athletes and GA players and hurlers, and one of the reasons I track my players for the first six weeks when I'm working with them in phase one of my program is because there's so many nuances. Some players are going to be naturally fit. Some players are going to be naturally strong. Some players are going to have the opposite where they're very strong but not naturally fit or they're very naturally fit but not naturally strong. So you have to cater to these things. You have to do that in every sport. But with football and hurling, you tend to see it more. And this is one of the reasons why players tend to peak quite early in GEA compared to some other sports. You'll see players peaking at 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, which is similar to some sports, but it's down to having that balance. You're getting that strength built up. You're having that physical confidence with your skill set in terms of your sport, and you're learning nutritional strategies and recovery strategies that work for you, but you're still taking hits, and you're still taking bangs all the way up through. So I think in terms of hurling versus football, they're very similar. Obviously, the skill sets are completely different, but in terms of how you prepare an athlete, it's, I would say it's nearly identical. The same as every protocol for strength and conditioning and sports nutrition with an athlete, there's going to be best practices, i.e. make sure you're getting physically stronger, fitter, potentially leaner if you're starting with a higher level of body fat or building on lean muscle tissue and building it the right way so you can improve that speed and power. But you also have to make the nuances depending on the starting point of the individual, where they're coming in from, what's their nutritional knowledge, what's their nutritional background, what lifestyle do they have. With GA, and this is something that I think comes under the radar a little bit, but when you think of high-level GA, particularly inter-county, but this is the same with some top-level clubs, you have athletes who are preparing like pro and professional athletes, but actually who aren't. They're amateur, meaning they have a, a job to go to Monday morning and they have a full-time job, and all these other life stressors. So they can't prepare like a professional athlete, although they train and try and recover like one. So that's what makes it so interesting. This is one of the reasons, actually, that you see a lot of adductor injuries and injuries with GA players, because you're trying to put your body under a load that a professional athlete would, but you don't have the same recovery and luxury and downtime as a professional athlete, hence why the balance is so... It's on a coin's edge or it's on a knife's edge at all times, which again, I think makes it so interesting. And I think that's what makes the content around it limitless. So when I'm putting up workouts or putting up nutritional ideas or creating podcasts, like the context and the amount of context needed depending on the circumstance means you could talk about it forever and it would never change in terms of, or the um, you'd never end in terms of the way you could talk about it. But I think it's a really interesting question. But my personal opinion is that they're very, very similar in terms of athletes, although the skill set's completely different. Brian, should I be doing sprint or five to ten kilometer runs for fitness until preseason starts? I the answer here is a combination of both is always going to be the best, but they work in kind of different ways. With sprints, you're working that creatine phosphate zone if you're working short term sprints, you know, 10, 20 meters, explosiveness. If you're talking longer sprints, 50 meters, 100 meters, obviously goes into a little bit of a different zone. But there's a lot of crossover to and a better bang for your buck in terms of the amount of time that it would take to do those and the response you'll get. So, for example, if you go out and do 10, 50-meter sprints, that's quite similar to what you'd be doing pre-season with a lot of clubs, particularly in some um, colleges, less so county, because it's a bit more of a structured plan based on the athletes that are working in those programs. But with the sprint sessions you have luxury in terms of how you do it and you have a lot of bang for your buck, meaning that doing those will have crossover for your overall fitness. You'll feel better. You'll feel like you're training and working in a movement and a range of zone and a a training zone that feels conducive to the sport. Whereas a five to 10 kilometer run, although it's great for aerobic fitness, you're never actually going to run five or 10 kilometers in a game in one go. You will stop, you'll start, you'll sprint. That's what mimics a GA game, football, hurling, ladies football, camogie. So although 5 to 10K runs are useful, and I actually have a lot of my players do them in the off-season as maintenance kind of runs to keep their aerobic fitness high, 
three to five kilometer runs depending on the program i don't think you need to go up to 10 kilometers but three to five kilometer runs just to maintain that aerobic fitness definitely has a time and a place especially if you fall on the less naturally fit side of the spectrum and you know if you're an athlete or a player who holds your strength regardless of what you do but you lose your fitness you should keep those runs ticking over for example i do a six to seven kilometer run every week probably a little bit on the high side but i also i'm coming down from an ultra marathon training program which is 100 120 kilometers per week so i can afford to go a little bit higher on this and still get the benefit so i go at one six to seven kilometer run per week just to stay on top of that aerobic fitness because if i don't it feels like after a week of non-running like i've never ran in my life i don't lose any of my strength i don't really lose any of my size but i lose my fitness as soon as i stop running so i have to build that into my off-season program just to maintain it but i'd say the combination of both is always going to be the best here i am in the process of and this actually is probably going to be out by the time this podcast comes out of designing a free running program that is going to be a very basic program that you can do on the pitch. We'll have a combination of longer runs mixed with sprints, mixed with different drills that you can do. Um, a combination will be sprints in one session, longer runs in another session, combination in the other session, but a four-day split. If that's ready by the time this podcast is out, I'll link it in the description below here as well. It'll just be a four-day free running program that you can do on the pitch that might be helpful. But the answer is up until pre-season and depending obviously on what part of the year you're in, the combination of both is always going to be the best. Final question. Brian, do you focus much on mobility? More so now. I do a lot more mobility work now than I once did. I do a lot of active recovery. I did a podcast. I think it was episode 50, possibly 55. I'm not sure about all the recovery protocols that are out there and the ones that I use. So everything from cryotherapy to sauna to jacuzzi to um, Normatec compression gear to supplements, etc., and kind of rated them on a overrated, underrated list. The ones that I think are brilliant, the ones that I use, the ones that I think are massively overrated. And I personally still do a bit of mobility work. What I tend to do now at this current moment is I intersperse a lot of my mobility work within my workouts. So I normally do them kind of intraset. So normally in between sets, I tend to superset and triset and put circuits into most of my workouts. So very rarely unless I'm following a strength phase, which I'm not at the minute, I'll go in and do straight sets. I normally have supersets, trisets, circuits, etc. So I'm doing multiple moves and then taking a break. But in between the movements, I'll normally do some mobility work or some banded resistance work. So if I am doing something like, say, a chest press followed by a chest fly followed by a spider push-up, let's say it's a chest triset or a chest circuit, while I'm resting... 90 to two seconds to two minutes in between sets on that i'll be doing mobility work so it'll either be intraset stretching glutes hamstrings etc or dynamic stretching or i'll be doing mobility work normally with bands i'm doing a lot of mobility work at the minute around my ankle i have an ankle injury from probably the age of 15 i sprained my ankle pretty badly years ago and it's a recurring injury so i have a lot of um uh what's the right word it's escaping me now but i've i've, I've too much range of motion in one of my ankles so I'm doing a lot of mobility work around that now. So just going up on my toes, going on one foot, twisting to the side, closing my eyes, twisting to the other side on, on a single foot. So a bit of mobility work within that. So I do a lot more of that now than I once did. But I also do a lot of active recovery when it comes to foam rolling, when it comes to ice, when it comes to heat, when I can get into the sauna. And all of those things add up. Now, they're marginal gains when it comes to recovery. I do think mobility is imp important. But again, it depends on your starting point. If you're somebody who doesn't get injured a lot, you probably don't need to focus that much time on mobility, trigger point tension, rolling, etc. Your stretching, flexibility. But if you're someone who does get injured quite frequently, this probably needs to be a higher priority on your list. So again, it's not a one-size-fits-all prescription. It depends on where you fall. And if you, similar to me, you have a history of injuries, you've been playing for a long time or in sport or working out for a long time, you're going to have that wear and tear on your joints, on your ligaments, on your muscles in general, your tendons. You're going to have to have a, probably a little bit extra focus on mobility and recovery strategies. Whereas if you're 17, 18, 19, you have no injury up to this point, you probably need to do a little bit of a minimum effective dose, meaning you do some bit just to keep it ticking over but it doesn't need to be the crux or the main section of your workout program or your rehabilitation or your prehabilitation strategy when it comes to prevention of injury so there's some things to consider that's what i do what i recommend so hopefully that helps 
that's everything from today's podcast again nice little range of questions from today's episode so hopefully you enjoyed it uh, for more details on my GA Lean Body Program I will link it in the description below for anyone that wants to work with me directly that's everything from me from this week's podcast catch you all next week